In this video, we're going to take a look at mechanical waves, what they are, how they're formed, and what the different types of waves and their properties are. A mechanical wave is nothing more than a disturbance of the medium. So a medium is literally anything. Uh, so that would be air or uh, a, your wooden desktop or whatever. Um, in, in the West, they used to have a trick, you know, in the 1800s where, uh, you know, the cowboys would stick their ear down to the railroad track and they would listen for a train which was coming that was out of sight. And different mediums have different properties in terms of how efficiently and how quickly a wave is transmitted through the material. For example, the speed of sound in air is 340 meters per second. Um, but the speed of sound in water is five times that value. Um, and so consequently, that's why when you're underwater, you can't tell which direction a noise is coming from. Um, but if you're standing outside in the air, uh, there's enough difference between your two ears that you can discern direction. So... Mechanical waves are the result of a disturbance in the medium, and uh, a wave pulse would be caused by a single disturbance. And I will demonstrate that for you in a minute. Okay, so that's a wave pulse. Now, if you have a repeating disturbance, then we have what we call a periodic wave. Okay, so let's take a look very quickly at what those two things are. All right, here I have a FET simulator, which is going to show you um, what a wave looks like. We can play it fast, we can play it slow, we can create damping, which we talked about the last time, and uh, we can also change the tension in the string, which we will do here in a little bit. But for right now, so there's a single wave pulse, and that is a pretty good looking sine curve for what we're doing. Okay, so it was a single disturbance, the one up and down, and that's all we've got, just this wave pulse that's traveling along. And... If I play it, that wave pulse just continues on into infinity, and that's that. Now, a repeating wave, or a periodic wave, is the result of a repeating disturbance. So if I go up and down and up and down, however many times I go up and down, that's what the disturbance is going to be. All right, and when I stop, the wave stops. Now, the purpose of a wave is to carry energy. So waves carry energy. But the way waves carry energy is not through a bulk motion of the material, but through small motion or just a little bit of motion of the particles of the medium. And what I mean by that is this. If a car is, you know, got some kinetic energy, you know, it could be moving very quickly. It's carrying a lot of energy. That car may drive 100 miles before, you know, it comes to a stop. It's large amounts of kinetic energy and deposits it somewhere else. Okay, so uh, if a car drives 100 miles and then it reaches its destination, when it steps on the brakes, it converts that kinetic energy into heat and that heat is deposited into the environment 100 miles away. Well, a wave is a little bit different than that, and the wave, um, for example, a transverse wave is one in which the particles go up and down perpendicular to the direction that the wave is traveling. So the wave is traveling in this direction, but a particle on, say, a string, it's going up and it's going down. That's all that's happening, right? Yet the wave is traveling a great distance to the right. And so it can travel many, many, many hundreds of miles, thousands of miles. And an example of that would be uh, an earthquake 
or a tsunami. Both of those are comprised of waves. Very quickly, I want to talk about uh, the speed of a wave. And mathematically, you're not responsible for understanding how to determine the speed of a wave on a string. But um, the very first year uh, AP Physics 1 came out, uh, we really weren't sure what was going on, and so I didn't teach anything at all related to uh, tension in the string and how that affects the wave or, um, you know, the mass of the string. How does that affect the speed of the wave? And honestly, it's because we really didn't know that that was something that needed to be taught. It wasn't clear in the curriculum guidelines from College Board. So, uh, nonetheless... I now do teach this, um, but you're not responsible for the equation part. I write the equation for those of you that are more mathematically minded, and it helps you to remember the concept. So the speed of a wave on a string is equal to the square root of the tension force divided by the mass per unit length. So basically what happens is the tension increases, the wave speed increases. If the mass per unit length increases, then the wave increases. And this is really just a fancy way of writing um, a heavier rope, you know, something that's got a greater density. It doesn't necessarily have to be thicker, but the density. Okay, so in fact, um, it's called linear density. Lambda is typically what we use to represent linear density, and that's just mass per unit length. This is similar to what you've seen, uh, you know, just about since the beginning of your uh, schooling career, you know, probably all the way back in third grade, and that is that density is equal to mass divided by volume. So it's a very similar concept, but instead of being mass divided by volume, it's mass divided by length, because we're essentially looking at a one-dimensional object. So this equation may also be written as V is equal to the square root of FT divided by lambda. And some authors use mu instead of lambda. So they might use that letter there. Okay, so we're going to go back to the simulation now so that we can try to understand uh, what is causing um, the wave motion. Okay, now a transverse wave is one in which the particles are moving perpendicular to the medium. And so I want to talk about what allows the transverse wave to be transverse. And it's very simple. When you pick up on, that's not what I meant to do, when you pick up on on this particle right here this green particle you go up with it what ends up happening is this particle is physically connected by bonds to the one beside it and the one beside it is connected to bond to the one beside that and the one beside that is connected to bonds beside that all right so effectively what happens is as this particle is going up as this particle is going up, it's pulling upward on this one. But this one, the green one here, is pulling down on the red one that just pulled up on it. That's a Newton's third law action-reaction force pair thing going on. And so this one here initially has a lot of velocity in the up direction, but its speed is decreasing as a result of this green particle pulling down. But this green particle has an increasing speed as a result of it being pulled up but the green particle is now being pulled down by the one beside it. Okay, and so it's really just a chain reaction of, of force pairs where the particle in, initially is going up, and so it pulls on all of its neighbors, and then finally you get to the top, and now you've got this particle which is pulling down, and the next one is pulling down, and the next one is pulling down. So these things are all connected like they're on a string, um, whether we're looking at a rope or a chain um, or a steel cable, it's all the same on a molecular level. You've got individual pieces which are connected together by bonds. That's what makes the particles go up and down, and consequently they also propagate forward. 
Now, as to why the speed of the wave changes with tension, that's actually really simple. The speed changes because with a greater tension force, you have greater forces between the particles. Larger forces lead to larger accelerations according to Newton's second law. And so basically everything is just going to be happening faster. Okay, so let's go ahead and discuss wave types. We've already basically discussed one type, and that was a transverse wave. And the transverse wave is one in which the medium moves perpendicular to the wave velocity or the wave direction. It only occurs in solid materials. So the solid material could be something like a train track, it could be something like your desktop, it could be something like a string or a change, but it's only going to occur in solid materials. Sometimes a transverse wave is referred to as an S wave, where S stands for shear. Now, a shear force is one that would um, easily be pictured by taking a thick book, and that thick book, when sitting normally, is positioned like that. But if you place your hand on top and you push on the book in that direction, the book is going to flex and look something like this. Okay, and that is the result of a shear force. Uh, scissors are sometimes referred to as shears, all right, because they use a large shear force to separate the fibers of whatever it is that you're trying to cut. The second type of wave is a longitudinal wave, and a longitudinal wave is not as easy to visualize, but uh, a longitudinal wave, let's describe it first, a longitudinal wave is one in which the medium moves parallel to the wave direction. A longitudinal wave can occur in any medium. And finally, it's sometimes called a P wave for pressure. So basically what ends up happening is when you create a P wave, it's like taking a spring and squishing it. Okay, you compress the spring, or you can take the spring, and if you grab both ends, you can stretch it out. And so the coils of the spring get tighter and further apart. They get closer together and further apart. And so when they get uh, closer together, it's called a condensation. And condensation would correlate to high pressure. When they get further apart, it's called a rarefaction, and the rarefaction would be considered low pressure. The kind of waves that, we, that we're studying are um, just simple waveforms, and these waves always take on a sinusoidal nature. And so when you take a, a wave on a string, for example, as you saw in the FET simulation, and you do that, we have basically what is a sine wave. So when you plot out a transverse wave as the vertical position versus the horizontal position, we do get the familiar sine curve. It looks something like that. However, a longitudinal wave cannot be plotted as y versus x. 
But we what we can do is we can plot the pressure difference from the normal surrounding pressures. And when we plot that, we get a sinusoidal curve. And so what I mean by that is this. You have a P wave created. And the pressure wave is going to create regions of high pressure and low pressure. So we start off, and if we look at this um, image that I'm about to draw as coils of a spring, then what we have is it starts off at normal atmospheric pressure, and the pressure is going to increase. So that means the coils are going to get closer and closer together until they're on top of each other. And then they're going to start to spread out again until they reach a normal spacing. And then they're going to spread out even more until they finally start to come back to their normal spacing. So we have regions of high pressure, which we could show here. This is high pressure. And then this would be low pressure. And so if we plot delta P versus position then we get once again our familiar sine curve so it becomes high pressure low pressure back to normal and I want you to see how that lines up with the graph here okay now there's one more interesting tidbit as it relates to transverse and longitudinal waves and they actually do have some uses you know scientists they have to be creative with uh, you know how they design experiments and analyze the world around um, literally in this case because there's no way to get to the center of the earth at least not with today's technology uh, the temperatures the pressures the radioactivity it, you know it's a lethal environment there's and there's no way to get anything down there in fact um, the last I heard we haven't even been able to successfully drill you know a four inch hole all the way through to the mantle so scientists have to come up with other ways of determining composition and properties and so um, the way they've determined that the center of the earth is liquid is by this if this represents the core then what they did was they knew an earthquake occurs over here and this is in its simplest form an earthquake occurs on this side of the earth over on this side you put a sensor and you end up creating both shear waves and pressure waves or s waves and p waves transverse waves longitudinal waves so the transverse waves would look like this but nothing came through to the detectors However, the pressure waves continued through to the detector. And so basically what this implies is that because an S wave only occurs in solid materials, the core of the Earth cannot be solid. This must be liquid, or at least with a liquid outer layer, which is what our current models um, make it out to be so we've got this liquid outer layer that doesn't allow the s waves through but the p waves can travel through now this is an oversimplified explanation of how it works but this is basically how it works um, of course there can be other things going on like wave reflections um, and refractions and we're not going to get into any of that right now okay in the next video we're going to take a look at wave behaviors